the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point Northern Aquaculture Demonstration Facility in cooperation with the Lactiflambo Indian Tribe and Wisconsin Sea Grant presents Pond Culture, an online workshop. This is the final presentation of the online Pond Culture module on fish management. Like the other components we have discussed previously, fish management is an art, not an exact science. Understanding your fish and how they interact in your rearing ponds is a very important part of being a successful fish producer. Whether you're rearing fish for food or for stocking, it is imperative that you have a good biological understanding of the fish in your ponds at every rearing stage. There are some general topics regarding fish management within ponds throughout the growing season. These include fish species selection, stocking fry or fingerlings, feeding practices, potential problems, sampling, fish health, and fish harvest in pond culture. We will touch on these topics and more with this presentation to make you better informed about this aspect of pond culture. In Wisconsin ponds, it is best to raise cool water species. Unless the pond is very deep or has substantial groundwater input, ponds will get too warm during the summer and oxygen levels will be too low for many cold water species like trout or salmon. The maximum temperature of the pond should not exceed 85 degrees Fahrenheit for cool water species. There are two minimum qualifications for a species to be raised successfully in pond culture. The first is the market. Will this species be profitable and where will it be sold? The second, which is biologically most important, is the water temperature and oxygen content of the pond. Every year, there is a growing cycle in which temperatures will reach optimum for that species and fish will grow the fastest. Due to Wisconsin's climate, the growing period is around 180 to 200 days, generally from May through October. Although warm water species such as catfish and bass can be raised in Wisconsin ponds during the warm seasons, the growing cycle is too short and production would not be as efficient. Three common food fish species that show good success and growth in Wisconsin are walleye, yellow perch, and bluegill. To begin this section on fish management, we will start with stocking fry into your pond. For our example, we are utilizing walleye fry. Typically strong swimming walleye fry that are three to five days old will be stocked into the pond. It is important to stock your pond with fry of the same age if possible. Sometimes even a few days can make a difference in the size and strength of the fry. Stocking a six day old fry with a three day old fry may lead to early cannibalism in the pond or in the fry tank. Strong swimming fry will be concentrated near a light source as shown in the fry tank photo. Walleye fry are innately attracted to light in their early life stages due to their initial food source of zooplankton, which are concentrated in the sunlit waters. Next, let's discuss in more detail the number of fry to stock in a pond. For walleye fry stocking densities varying from 25,000 per acre to 240,000 per acre for drainable or undrainable ponds. Number of fry stocked into your ponds is related to your pond's productivity, your harvest plan, and your market strategy. Often higher numbers of fry are stocked in highly fertilized and managed ponds with the purpose of producing lots of small fingerling walleye. On the other hand, stocking lower numbers of fry into a less fertilized and less managed pond, such as a natural pond, which may not be harvested until later in the summer or fall for larger fingerlings. It's important to understand what the final product of the pond is before stocking fry. A good rule of thumb is probably around 50 to 100,000 per acre. You have to decide for your individual pond. This slide reiterates how there is an inverse relationship between how many fry are stocked and fish size at harvest. In common terms, the more fry stocked into a pond, usually the smaller the fish are at harvest. 
Some hatcheries may harvest small fingerlings to reduce the density in the pond and backstock an exact number, which are then reared out to an extended growth size. By utilizing this methodology, more small fingerlings can be grown and harvested from a pond, and this may create a surplus of small fingerlings which may be sold or used in a different way. Generally, small fingerlings or phase one walleyes are reared for about 30 to 40 days on plankton in the pond until they are about 1.5 to 2 inches long. After this size, or the phase two walleye, are looking for larger diet items and are much more piscivorous or fish eating. Counting fry can be accomplished several ways. One method is volumetrically, which can be done by collecting a subsample of fry into a known volume of water and hand counting individual fry. This average can then be applied to the volume of fry collected in the container. Remember, this is just an estimate and not an exact amount. We have found this methodology can be off by a considerable margin, up to 20%, depending on many variables. <clears throat> Another more exact way of counting fry is to use a mechanical fry counter, which counts each fry that will be stocked. We have found this to be a fairly accurate system within 10%, and that does not harm the fry. There are several other systems for counting fry available on the market as well. Although the mechanical fry units may be quite accurate, they are also costly, ranging from $5,000 to $8,000. Whatever methodology you decide to use, it is important to have an estimate beginning number of fry stocked into the pond for management purposes. To stock the fry, they can be collected with water utilizing a container and placed into buckets or bags with oxygenated water. These bags and buckets can then be floated in the pond while the water temperature is equalized between the fry and the pond water. Try to avoid direct sunlight during this process. Fry are very vulnerable and sensitive to changes in the environment. Therefore, tempering fry must be done slowly and carefully. Another good tip is to stock the fry early in the day when the weather is calm to increase survival. If it's a windy day, fry can be blown into the shallows where it's too warm and where oxygen is low. As we discussed in the fertilization pond presentation, there are several types of fertilizer available to stimulate algae and plankton growth. For an analogy of the fertilization process, we fertilize the grass or the phytoplankton to feed the cows or the zooplankton to feed the wolves, which are the walleyes. Although we focused on specific zooplankton species in the pond management presentation, we will now focus on how the biology of the fish relates to these forage types. Again, it's very important to understand the species of fish you are rearing in your ponds and what they are feeding on, which is usually related to the mouth gap. Understanding that walleye fry are approximately 8 to 12 meters long when placed into a pond. And as stated previously, small zooplankton species are necessary for the initial feeding, such as rotifers and copepods. And as the fish grow larger, they will feed on larger plankton, such as daphne species. This slide shows the mouth gape of a walleye at six days post hatch. Even though the gape is relaxed, we can show here that this walleye will be looking for food over 1.5 millimeters in width. Because walleyes are top carnivores and are cannibalistic, their mouth gape can be quite large and they will continue to search out larger and larger prey. Let's continue to the next slides to illustrate this fact. These bar graphs show how copepods and daphne are important food items for young walleye in early May. Larger food sources such as insect larvae or dipterians become increasingly more important as fingerlings grow and become larger. You can see in the light colored bars that the fry are preferring copepods and daphnia, but as the fish age, they switch diets to more dipterian and hemiptera as shown in the dark to black bars. Let's look more closely at this in the next slide. This bar chart shows us in more detail how the diet of young walleye changes over time in the pond as the fish grows in length. 
By looking at the axis on the left side, we can see the percent of prey occurrence. Looking at the axis on the right hand side, we see the total length of the fish in millimeters. Starting out on May 7th, the larva walleye is selecting for copepods and daphnia, about 80% to 65% respectively, with dipterians occurring only around 10%. But as the fish grows, shown by the red line, prey selectivity begins to shift to less copepods and more dipterians, ending up in June 5th with a diet of 65% dipterian and less than 40% copepods observed in the diet. When walleye reach sizes of around 40 to 50 millimeters, they are highly piscivorous. Therefore, forage minnows should be added if raising fish to a larger size. This chart shows us the importance of providing the correct size and numbers of various prey items for the young walleye to feed on while in the pond. This will have a direct bearing on the survival of walleye in your pond from the beginning and it is very important to understand in order to be successful. When walleye reach approximately 1.5 to 2 inches or around 30 to 40 days in the ponds and the zooplankton levels are dropping off, they begin looking for larger feed items such as coronamids and minnows. It is beneficial to remove the walleyes around this time if you are harvesting small fingerlings. In order to continue growing to a larger size, also known as extended growth, it is very beneficial to remove the walleyes at this stage to obtain total production numbers and to restock a known amount into a grow out pond. Total numbers of fish will also be used to determine the adequate minnow forage for continued growth. Minnows of appropriate size should then be provided to the walleyes. This is an important transition time and requires very small fathead minnows called toughies. Most of these are imported from southern states like Arkansas, but can also be found here in Wisconsin. After several weeks of toughies, the walleye usually can be moved up to a less expensive and more locally produced fathead, typically used for fishing crappies. In a few weeks, the extended growth walleyes, which are about six to eight inches, can handle regular size fatheads until they are harvested in the fall. The amount of minnows to the walleye is consider considerably variable depending on the hatchery operation, but good rule of thumb is about four to six pounds of minnows per pound of walleye produced. This slide is illustrating a weekly minnow delivery for the growing walleye in one of our ponds at NADF. Regular weekly delivery of minnows keeps walleyes well fed and limits size variation. Both of these concepts help to lessen cannibalism. This is again why it's very important to provide adequate forage during the entire growing season. Minnows should be scheduled far in advance with a bait dealer to ensure delivery and availability. Before stocking forage minnows, it is crucial to temper the hauling water to match the pond water. This can be done by slowly pumping pond water directly into the delivery truck as shown in the photo. If minnows experience temperature shock, high mortality can result and the minnows will be wasted. Be sure to check the temperature of the pond and the minnow tanks to make sure that they are within a few degrees of each other before stocking the minnows. Minnows can also be reared in the ponds. While minnows may spawn on natural vegetation, additional substrate may be provided to boost production. Some common substrates that can be utilized include plastic tubs, buckets, wooden pallets, and bricks. Fatheads are commonly used as walleye forage and are prolific spawners. They will spawn several times throughout the summer if conditions are right. Other species may also be used for forage, although size and availability may be an issue. Whichever forage is used, it's important to match the size and quantity of the minnow to the needs of the fish. Some fish reared in ponds, such as yellow perch, largemouth bass, and bluegill, can be fed with formulated feed. In ponds, fry feed first on zooplankton until large enough for a commercialized feed. The age and the size to begin feeding will depend on the species. Generally, the fingerlings first need to be trained to accept formulated feed and then pellets can be utilized in ponds for feeding. 
There are several management practices in aquaculture regarding pellet feeding. The first is to never overfeed fish. Not only is overfeeding a production cost, it is also may lead to poor water quality and increased pollutants in your ponds. Another good practice is to use floating food for certain species. This is recommended when raising fish. It's important to observe their habits, especially when feeding. By watching your fish feed, it's important to know that they are healthy, and secondly, to know when to stop. Some species will feed more aggressively on floating food during low light levels at dawn and dusk. Therefore, it's a good idea to feed during these times if possible for these species. In contrast, during the winter, sinking feeds may be preferred because fish will be less active, having lower metabolism. And feeding ratios at this time should be low. The fish should be fed sparingly to not have wasted feeds, which can not only be costly, it can also be dangerous to water quality as the feed decomposes. Feed can be supplied to the fish in a variety of ways through mechanical feeders or by hand. This picture shows a pond feeder for perch that was constructed with a simple leaf blower and some modifications. This enables broadcast feeding to the fish in the pond quickly and efficiently. The bottom line is it's crucial to understand the biology of the fish you are rearing to provide them with the correct feed and type of feed while following the general management practices. Changes occurring in a pond environment over the season may pose many issues for production. One problem that may be detrimental to the population is the decline of zooplankton, the main food source for young fry. This may not only lead to a lack of fitness due to starvation, but can also lead to increased cannibalism within the pond. Walleyes have an innate behavior to search out large prey, and due to their mouth gape, they are able to consume fish near their own size. This photo shows a walleye fry around 12 days post-hatch already cannibalizing its brother or sister. This is again to explain how important the available food sources are in a pond environment. Another issue that may arise as the pond season ages is the establishment of aquatic predaceous insects. These include dragonfly larvae, back swimmers, diving beetles, and others which may prey upon larval fish and can also cause issues during harvest. It can be difficult to manage predaceous insects Although vegetable oil may be utilized to help control back swimmers and other air breathing insects in ponds, especially during harvest. Other problems in pond culture can be a variety of unwanted guests. In this slide, you can see the predator and frog fence to proactively prevent frogs and turtles from entering the pond area and laying their eggs. While frogs and toads do not directly prey on fingerling fish, sorting tadpoles from fingerlings is a difficult task when you are harvesting small 1 to 2 inch fish. The tadpoles may also indirectly affect fish production by consuming plankton and or compete for the same resources as the plankton populations in the pond. Taller fencing may deter larger mammals such as otters and mink and even deer from easily entering the ponds to not only prevent predation but also as safety precautions and to protect your liners if you're utilizing lined ponds. Another potential issue in pond production is avian predation. This can be from great blue herons, kingfishers, cormorants, and even loons. And it can be severely detrimental to fingerling numbers in ponds. Several ways to deter these predators include installing devices such as balloons, plastic owl decoys, and even the use of sound making devices like noise cannons. Another effective way may be to keep your pond turbidity high with clay or dye so that the birds cannot see the fish easily. Turbidity can also be increased by stirring up the bottom of the pond manually using airlifts or maybe introducing larger white suckers with the production fish to stir the bottom up. Placing a wire or string around the shallow ends of the ponds may also cause wading species like blue herons to hunt elsewhere. 
There are many options out there, and these are just a few. Part of fish management is sampling your fish regularly, at least every few weeks. Sampling fish in the pond is important for several reasons. First, it allows you to monitor the growth and health of the fish in your pond. Secondly, you may be able to guesstimate how the population of fish is doing in the pond based on the numbers collected in a sample net. Thirdly, it may also help monitor other management items such as forage numbers and vegetation issues. Sampling periodically is important to manage your pond and the fish populations effectively to better understand what to expect for harvest. There are several common methods to sample fish from a pond. Sane nets can be used to sweep an area of the pond and to collect a quick sample of fish. Saning takes at least two people and works well for fry and small fingerlings. Sanes can also be used for harvesting larger fish, although this may be more labor and time intensive, as well as stressful on the fish. It can be difficult to use sanes in natural ponds where there may be a lot of debris or vegetation. Another common option for sampling is to use fike nets or hoop nets, which can be placed in a pond for extended periods, generally overnight. Fike nets are time efficient, may be good for sampling larger fish, and do not discriminate about the size of the fish they capture. For either seine nets or fike nets, there are a variety of sizes available. The size depends on your pond size, fish species, and reason for collection whether you're collecting for harvest or for sampling. A unique method of sampling fry that are photopositive, such as walleye, is to use a simple light trap shown here and place this into a pond at night. The fry are attracted to the light, swim through the opening in the bucket. After a period of time during the night, the bucket can be removed and the fry collected and observed. Sampling fish also provides an insight to the health of the fish being reared. Understanding fish health is an important aspect of pond management. Stress is a major factor of fish susceptibility to disease. The difference between fish health and outbreaks depends on the interactions between the disease agent, the fish, and the environment. Fish are susceptible mostly to parasitic diseases, but can also be susceptible to fungal, bacterial, and viral diseases. Common parasites include flukes, which infect the skin or the gills, and different grubs, which may infect the muscles of the fish. Although parasites may be present in the water, usually outbreaks occur when environmental quality has degraded or fish immunity has been compromised. If a disease outbreak should occur, treatment may become difficult and costly. Due to the large volume of a pond, chemically treating can be very expensive and physically separating out infected fish is quite challenging. On a different note, bringing fish indoors from pond environment for any reason is a huge biosecurity risk to a hatchery or a facility. Oftentimes, pond fish will break out with bacterial fish health issues such as columnaris or whitetail syndrome, which can cause high mortality and can be easily transferred to other fish. A recent fish health certification is often required for stocking or moving fish. A good manager has his fish tested periodically before moving them to limit the risks for everyone involved. The final stage in fish management is harvesting. The only way to harvest ponds completely is by drawdown or draining the water into an internal or external catch basin. These basins work well for small to extended growth fingerlings or fish ranging from around 1.5 to 15 inches in length. There are means of harvesting for natural or non-drainable ponds in which seine nets, trap nets, or gill nets can also be used without draining the pond. Completely draining a pond is beneficial in commercial pond culture as it provides accurate inventory, allows for harmful parasites, diseases, and predators to die off or relocate, and allows for mechanical removal of organic decomposing material from the bottom of the pond. 
Here's an example of harvesting extended growth walleye fingerlings utilizing a seine net. This is an example of harvesting fish from an internal catch kettle. This type of catch kettle is located right in the pond near the outlet and allows capture of fish in a depressed area, usually made out of concrete. This allows for individual pond draining to keep species and strains separate. During harvest with this type of collecting kettle, be aware of water quality and make sure that a source of fresh water and oxygen is being provided as you bring down the pond. You may have to remove fish as well from the kettle as the pond is draining. Trying to fit all the fish from a pond in this type of a kettle is not recommended without some removal during the process. This photo shows a mechanical fish pump. In this example, walleye are being sand into a small area and loaded into the hopper, which then pumps the fish up out of the pond into the hauling truck. This type of unit has been in use for cold water fish for many years in the industry. But recently, it is being tested on cool water fish such as walleye. It may help to lower labor costs and injury to the fish as compared to bucketing and netting the fish out of the pond. This slide is showing an external catch kettle utilized for fish harvest. External catch kettles vary from the earlier internal catch kettle in that they are usually larger and can hold more water and more fish at one time. Additionally, they can be set up to drain multiple ponds with the same kettle. Catch kettles work very well for multiple sizes of fish and reduce stress on the fish considerably more than some other methods. The fish are transferred through piping via gravity into the kettle where they are harvested and loaded directly onto a truck in one smooth operation. External catch kettles have been very effective for safe harvesting of fish at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point Aquaculture Facility and they are highly recommended for drainable ponds. This shows the external catch kettle in greater detail. The pond slowly drains over the course of several days by gravity into the basin. The kettle is supplied with pond and fresh water as well as aeration. Usually the fish are netted from the kettle. They are weighed for inventory. They can also then be placed into holding pools outside the kettle and transported to another pond at the facility or they can be placed directly into the truck for hauling away. Fish harvest can have negative effects on fish and the environment if not practiced carefully. First, by complete drainage of a pond, significant quantities of nutrients may be added to the surrounding waterways. This is mainly the high nutrient loads at the bottom of the pond and efforts should be done to minimize the disturbance of the bottom when the last quarter of the pond is draining out. Effluent can be managed by the use of settling and clarifying ponds. Harvesting is also stressful on fish no matter what technique is used. This is due to a physical abrasions as well as rapid water quality changes. Especially when fish are to be kept alive after harvesting, every effort should be done to minimize stress. This includes draining ponds slowly to limit fish entanglement and vegetation and also careful handling needs to be practiced when transferring fish. Because of the high stress during this time, disease transfer and susceptibility is much higher. Therefore, procedures should be done to reduce the risk of disease transfer from pond to pond. These include thoroughly drying and disinfecting all of harvest equipment before the use in another pond, having specific equipment to only be used in ponds containing the same stock of fish, and lastly, using a 0.7% salt solution to minimize stress for fish that are being hauled in water. At this point, you have invested a lot of time, effort, and money into fish production. Therefore, during the harvest, do not cut corners to have a, to have a successful year. This concludes the fourth module of the Pond Culture Workshop. 
We would like to acknowledge the resources and professionals that have provided information which has been utilized for this module. We hope this helps you become a more effective pond manager. This module is meant to be an introduction to the fish management portion of pond culture management and is to be a prerequisite for further training. Thank you for your attention. We would like to make a final acknowledgement to the groups that made this workshop possible. We would also like to again thank the University of Wisconsin Sea Grant Institute for providing funding for this workshop. This concludes our online training modules for pond culture. Now you should have a fairly good understanding of all the aspects of constructing, managing, fertilizing, and rearing fish in outdoor ponds. Remember though, rearing fish in ponds is an art and takes many years to become proficient. We would encourage you to visit with other aquaculture and fish rearing experts to learn as much as you can about pond culture. After completing all the online training modules, you are now ready to partake in the hands-on training sessions at the Northern Aquaculture Demonstration Facility. Please go to the facility webpage for training schedules and sign up. Thank you for taking the Pond Culture online workshops. Please feel free to send any questions, comments, or suggestions regarding this workshop to Emma Wierma at 715-779-3262 or E-W-I-E-R-M-A-A at uwsp.edu. We hope to see you for the hands-on training portion of this workshop soon. Thank you.